The mid-20th century was rich in incredible projects. The dystopian geniuses of all leading countries invented wonderwaffles of varying degrees of madness and only a small part of them reached practical implementation at least in the form of experiments. It is also interesting that not all of those embodied in reality are known to the general public. Rings of dust and ice of the planets, a beautiful phenomenon, just look at the images of Saturn. And common enough in the cosmos, in the solar system, all the gas giants, and even some asteroids have rings. As we know, the Earth currently has no rings. Neither do the other planets of the Earth group. More precisely, some dust underring our planet has, but they are fixed with great difficulty, even by special equipment. There are suggestions that in ancient times, the Earth could periodically acquire rings after interaction with other space objects. And that it is their shading of the surface could cause a cooling of the climate, for example, at the turn of the Eocene and Oligocene 34 million years ago, which caused the icing of the Antarctic and the transformation of a wet tropical forest planet into a world of vast steppes and savannas. But so far these are just theories. The reality is that in the 1960s, the US military built artificial rings for the Earth. This is not a conspiracy theory, but a real-life project called Westford. In the 1950s, the Cold War was at its first peak. The US military was convinced that the USSR was dreaming of hurrying armadas of tanks to conquer Europe and Asia, encircling the Soviet Union with a system of bases in allied territories from Greenland to Japan to Alaska. Submarines and aircraft carriers were plying the oceans, strategic bombers with nuclear weapons on board were on watch in the skies 24-7. The whole global military system was almost meaningless without reliable global communications. In the climate of paranoia that Kubrick described so well in Dr. Strangelove, it was important to be able to give immediate orders to ships and planes anywhere on the planet. This is now provided by the hundreds of communication satellites that literally clutter the near-Earth space. In the 1950s, it was very difficult. Let me remind you, the very first artificial satellite in the history of mankind, the USSR launched in October 1957. The US military had to either use underwater cables and transmit information through a chain of transmitters to communicate with distant bases, planes, and squadrons, or use ionospheric radio communication, which was not particularly reliable and very capricious, depending on solar activity and other factors. Worse, the Pentagon feared that secret Soviet submarines with bathyscaphs might at the critical moment simply cut deep-sea communications cables, leaving the troops on the front lines of future war without reliable communications with their commanders. Something had to be done about it. The idea came in 1958 from Walter E. Morrow of the Lincoln Laboratory at the famed MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Established in 1951, the laboratory, which was not even located in the MIT buildings, but not far away at Hanscom Air Force Base near Boston, worked for the War Department and among other things dealt with radar and radio communications so the problem was well known to them. Morrow suggested that since submarine cables could be cut, communications through the ionosphere were unreliable and artificial satellites were only taking their first steps into space, we needed a new plan, even if it sounded a little crazy. Have we learned how to launch simple objects into space yet? Great. We'll launch a giant cloud of dipole reflectors into space. It will be more reliable than the ionosphere and even the Soviet communists couldn't collect millions of needles in outer space. In general, the idea was not new. Back in 1945, Arthur C. Clarke, the future great science fiction writer, then a lieutenant in the Royal Air Force who worked on aviation radars, suggested using captured German V-2s for mass launch into geostationary orbit and ensuring stable global radio communications. But then it did not come to fruition, but in the late 1950s, the US military gave the project the go-ahead. Times were harsh, no money was spared on defense, and for all its phantasmagoric technical project, named after the nearby town of Westford Laboratory, cost by the standards of the Pentagon penny. It took only about 20 kilograms of copper to produce the first 480 million needles, which were 17.8 millimeters long, half the wavelength of the 8 gigahertz frequency, and 25.4 micrometers thick. These needles were to be dispersed from special dispensers around the Earth orbit, to form an artificial ring of the Earth and to provide the US armed forces with reliable radio communications almost anywhere on the planet.
However, not all American scientists working for the military and for the space program took the idea positively. Many expressed concerns even at the development stage. Even though the microneedles, due to their tiny mass even at space speeds, were unlikely to pose any significant threat to orbital flights, but they were among the first clouds of space debris in near-Earth space, they could cause difficulties for scientific radio telescopes and, worse, interfere with communications with spacecraft on missions beyond Earth orbit. The military was eager to get a reliable global link by throwing a cloud of needles into orbit but the scientists' outrage and fears reached President Kennedy. He suggested a compromise solution, first, let's launch not very many into a not very high orbit, 3500 to 3800 kilometers from the Earth's surface so that the needles themselves, under the action of gravity, will fall back to Earth in the next few years and see what happens. And then we will decide further. The first unit Westford one with needles, which included a container and a dispenser, went into Earth orbit on October 21, 1961. To save money, it was included in the launch, the main purpose of which was to put into orbit the Midas-4 Early Warning Missile Warning System satellite. However, the launch was unsuccessful, and neither the satellite nor the needle container reached the desired orbit. The project was not secret, it was quite openly reported in the media as an achievement of American science and technology, especially since things were not going well in the space race in Washington. The Soviet Union immediately and loudly outraged the Westford project in TASS on behalf of the entire progressive scientific community, accusing the Pentagon hawks of littering space. The Soviet outrage, apart from criticizing the Cold War rival and the space race, had a reason, and not coincidentally, the protest was made by scientists both in the United States itself and in the allied United States of Great Britain. At the United Nations, the Americans had to justify themselves to representatives of many other countries concerned about questionable actions in space, and Ambassador Stevenson even had to promise in the General Assembly to consult other countries before such bold experiments. Nevertheless, the project continued, the military needed their communications, and the Lincoln Laboratory and Walter E. Morrow, its future director, needed the results of the experiment. On April 9, 1962, along with the satellite Midas 5 went into orbit, another container with needles, westward drag, but with it not very well. Only May 9, 1963, the Americans were able to put into orbit both Midas 7 and westward 2. The first was the first spacecraft ever to record from space a rocket launch on Earth. The second, however, finally spewed out Project Westward needles between 3,500 and 3,800 kilometers above the Earth's surface. After forming a ring of dipole reflectors around the Earth, or rather a bagel of needles 15 kilometers wide and 30 kilometers thick, interestingly, it was not oriented along the equator and passed over the North and South Poles, May 14 scientists from the Lincoln Laboratory conducted through it a successful session of voice radio communication with colleagues from California at frequencies from 7.75 to 8.35 GHz. The data rate was about 20 kilobits per second. The system worked, but it didn't last long. Not only did the needles continue to scatter in space, reducing the efficiency of the ring cloud work, the orbit was too low, and the needles were declining under the influence of gravity. Already by July 2, 1963, communication through the rarefied space ring became almost impossible, and the experiment was terminated. As late as the end of that May, scientists from Cambridge, Britain, again expressed categorical indignation and condemnation to the Americans, a condemnation that was shared by many. This was superimposed on the 1962 U.S. nuclear tests in space. The Pentagon and NASA's daring but questionable space experiments increasingly angered not only the USSR, but also their own fellow citizens and allies. At the height of the Cold War, however, this might have been overlooked, the Cuban Missile Crisis had just ended, almost provoking a world nuclear war, and military security was the priority. It was not so much the protests of scientists and diplomats, who sincerely angered Walter E. Morrow and other members of the Lincoln Laboratory, as the rapid development of more advanced technology that brought the Westford project to a halt. As early as 1962, the first American communication satellite, Telstar, the granddaddy of all modern satellite communications systems, was successfully launched into orbit. The private spacecraft, developed by the AT&T Communications Company, 
which realized the commercial prospects of space, transmitted across the Atlantic not voice radio communications, but a full-quality television signal. It showed that communication through space is better done by a very different model than launching huge rings of dipole reflectors into Earth orbit. The Westford project was shut down, and no more artificial rings were attempted on Earth. But the controversy surrounding it was one of the reasons for the creation and signing of the International Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which to this day is the basis of the Earth's space law. Most of Westford's copper needles already crumbled to Earth in the first years after the launches. Particularly many of them fell in Greenland, up to five needles per square kilometer were found there. However, not all of them fell down. According to current estimates, at least 36 clouds of needles left after the first failed launches are still hanging in Earth orbit. However, against the background of various and much heavier space debris flying there, they are almost unnoticeable and pose no danger to spacecraft remaining a kind of monument to the bizarre experiments of the beginning of the space age of mankind. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Tell us interesting facts you know about the topic of this video. See you in new videos.